Hi, everyone. I'm Jared Finder. Uh, I work at Google, and I'm here to talk to you about a bunch of new developments from Daydream and Tango. Uh, before I begin, I'm actually curious. How many of you have like used Daydream before? Show of hands. I'm going to get a picture. I kind of, I've been told I have to get this, so hang on. It's going to be a uh, cardboard camera panorama, so let me just get to that. A panorama. There we go. So show of hands, everyone who's used Daydream. Thank, thank you for bearing with me here. Cool. And how many of you have used or heard of Tango before, Google's augmented reality? Wow. Wow. That, that's all, no, okay, I got to get another picture. Like, that is so cool. Please bear with me. <laughs> you know, it helps to show to the higher ups just where knowledge is. So all of you have, like, used and heard, or heard of Tango before. How many of you have just used it? Less hands. Okay. Not that much less, actually. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, oh. So uh, I'm engineering manager for all the engine integration work on Daydream and Tango. Kind of my group's whole goal is to make sure it's super easy to build really high quality VR, AR experiences in engines like Unity, which already I know you all came here because you're building stuff in Unity. And while we're doing this, we want to make sure that you can build the best experience possible while avoiding these alligator infested swamps that you can run into that get in the way, making your app low performance or difficult to use. So I kind of think of virtual and augmented reality as this new frontier that we're get right now all going through, exploring, settling, and developing in. And the thing is that I have a video game background. I spent much of my career making games and like, when I was making games, I would think, what was it like back when video games were this new experience? No one really knew what it was. Genres were still being defined, right? It must have been so cool because the world was just an open space and you would have to figure out the rules to make things. This is where I think we are now. VR and AR are so early that it's really like we have a completely blank map to fill in. But the stakes are so much higher because there's just so much interest. You know, we, we're getting to play with a completely new way of interacting with computers and finding brand new applications that are enabled by that. You know, these are new ways to increase our productivity or just new experiences that can be made. And so, like I'm putting up here, the, def the definition for frontier. And I just really like this definition. It's what we're doing. We're at the limit of our understanding and achievement in this interactive area. If you try to visualize this where we are, it's this crazy multi-dimensional world. You, know, you picture all the possible virtual reality, augmented reality experiences they're like points in this crazy hyper n dimensional space. You know, each axis is a different choice that you can make. Each point refers to a very particular app or experience. You could imagine that that point right in the center moving around, that's like Google Tilt Brush running on an HTC Vive, building art in this uh, experiential VR way. And um, every single Attribute is really dependent also on the hardware you're running on, you know, the control scheme you're using, even silly things like the number of cats you've decided to put inside your game. These all feed into the experience. It's a very, very large 
dimensional space, very high n. So, you know, it's kind of hard to actually picture yourself what this means in a point. Like, you can't think, at least I can't think, in a crazy 32 dimensional way. So, I like to simplify it down to this 2D plane. You can think of us as we're, in the ma we're on the frontier, you know, back in settlement times, trying to just explore this new space. But we still have that property that through the magic of our projection, that every, the distance between spaces is preserved. So any type of experience you're making, if it's a small distance, you have a small change among all those axes. You know, that might be adding one additional platform into your game, or maybe removing one of those cats. You know, this is the space that we're starting to explore. You know, each of these points is a unique VR experience, and because it's the frontier, most of these haven't even been created yet. You know, each, so we're going very iteratively, and every iteration yields a new experience. This land is huge, and frankly, much of it will make you kind of ill. But unlike other um, frontier experiences, you don't have to actually worry about getting dysentery. Additionally, I like to think about, yeah, I saw you got, you got the joke there. Thank you. Uh, I like to think about there being one additional dimension here. In addition to this 2D space, you can think of height is how deep the technology feeds into the experience. The higher up it is, you can think of the easier it is. And as you get deeper, we're requiring more technology, creating, r relying on deeper technological achievements. So the water level represents the current state of our hardware and software tech. The place we want to be to create the best possible experience is right there on the beach. As time goes on, our hardware is getting better. And so you can think of the water level going down and receding. So there's more frontier to explore, more experiences that can be made. This is that frontier that I'm hoping to help you explore. I had a fancy thing here, but I'm just going to skip it. So I'd love you to join our settlement and make, your base, make it your base camp while exploring this brand new valley of virtual reality and augmented reality. You know this picture back here? This is San Francisco, where I came from, back in 1851. You can see, it looks totally different from like, what it is now, right? In this presentation, I'm going to tell you about five different exploration tools to help settle this frontier. We've got Daydream Elements, the Renderer, Instant Preview, Environmental Pathfinding, and VPS. And you'll see all these things, just like it's a big change from where it was at San Francisco 1851 to now, we're going constantly to a big change from where the tech is now and where the tech will be in a few years. So let's start with Daydream Elements. This is like our map making effort, right? We've got this huge unexplored area and this is our way of providing you good points to go to within this world. Where each of the elements, it's a collection of samples each of them highlight an experience that shows best practices that we've discovered thus far. Each of those points is a place to start your exploration, a good, safe base camp to expand out from. Now, there are a lot of unknowns in terms of what's possible in VR and AR. And by working closely with a bunch of developers, we've been able to identify some of these best practices and codify them so that you can use them to build your game. Each of these uh, shows a particular solution to a UI problem that we've uh, had. Right now, it's available on Play Store, and actually the source code is all open source, so you can get it on GitHub as well. 
there are six different elements. The top three up here, they all show different approaches to locomotion, teleportation, tunneling, and a chase cam. The next two are different ways of doing pie menus, which are useful for selecting among a bunch of different items. And finally, we have our daydream renderer, which allows you to create, see what a demo scene can really look like when you're pushing the limits of the GPU and CPU to create a super high quality experience. We have more of these in the pipe, by the way. We're planning to do regular updates here so that we can uh, create more elements and show you what else is possible. Let's look at some of them. So I'd imagine for those of you who've done, played a VR game, you're, we're all familiar with teleportation. It's one of the simplest and most comfortable ways to do locomotion in VR. We've included it to create, to make it easy for all of you to create what we found is the best possible way to do locomotion. There's a lot of subtle details here to actually get right in teleportation. How to make that selection arc look right to communicate best where you're going to go. How to actually transition between one point and another. We found that actually it helps to have a little bit of an animation very quickly so that you have context for where you've gone. But you can't make that too long or else it's uncomfortable to the players. You know? So notice also that when we're doing this, the visual design, all of those assets are included as well. They're all very white and simple to give the feeling of a space that you're just starting to build. And so we think that when you're starting prototyping, you can use all these to white box out your environment and build something that looks a little better than programmer cubes and spheres and doesn't detract from that experience you're trying to make. But to get the user really immersed in your world, you often will want something a bit more that feels like walking around. Continuous locomotion is really the way to go here. Uh, unfortunately, in VR, it turns out that if you just move a camera directly, it very quickly makes your users feel sick for most people. There are a few blessed people out there who are able to feel fine. But it turns out that just pulling in the field of view and hiding the peripheral and putting instead a static grid helps a ton to make people not feel uncomfortable. So this is like one of those alligator infested swamps I was talking about. The details of getting this just right can actually be pretty hard. Uh, we, we've again tried to make this something you can just easily drop into your game and use to start as a best practice. Going to selection, having a click-based pie menu is a wonderful way with the, touch, the touchpad on the controller to select between a hierarchy of options. It only requires very small movements of the controller, so it feels very natural. Making sure that the menu stays in a consistent position is really important to give the user's muscle memory about how to actually select items. And it's a click menu because users are constantly pointing and clicking at different items. You, know, you don't have, but sometimes, while this is, or this is great, but sometimes the time it takes to point and click can be a bit too cumbersome. To get around that, we've created our next version of interaction, which is a swipe menu. The swipe menu allows you to very quickly swipe between a handful of different elements. We built this demo to show off just how much faster it can be. You see there are a bunch of balloons that you have to shoot, and you have to shoot them with the right color. To make it so that we had additional pressure here, we actually pushed it so you only have 60 seconds to pop as many balloons as possible. It turns out that just adding that, that little bit of challenge and that time pressure 
made it kind of fun as a little game. And you know, this getting rid of those extra clicks and the controller menu and the motion was huge. We tried it out using the click menu, and the score you get, the number of balloons you pop, is drastically down, like half. Uh, we have, so switching instead to this swipe menu makes it so much faster and easier. Yeah. We have more ideas, by the way. These are just a few of the basic UI elements that we're building to make easy for you to build good VR experiences. And we have more ideas that are coming along the way. Yeah. These elements are all open source so that you can easily drop them into your Unity project. We worked hard to make sure that all the code is production quality and that you can, so that you can ship them and put them inside your existing shipping game. It's really not just a map of the best places to go. It's a suite of little houses in each place that you can use as your home base when you're building your unique experience, and you can build off of them. Now, of course, we also want all our apps to look as good as possible, maintaining high frame rate while we're doing this exploration. So naturally, we want to be at the deepness and at the closest we can get to that water level at the coasts. Unfortunately, it turns out that a lot of the techniques that work well on PC and on console don't translate well to mobile. And so we find ourselves going from the coast where we get the best experiences to the safety of the hill of flat shading or mount, mountain of bake lighting much further away from where we can create the, opt the highest quality graphical experience. So this, this works. This creates an art style. But it's good to still have the option of trying to get back to the coast. So Daydream Renderer is a suite of replacement shaders for the ones that are built in to Unity and ship with it. They're designed by combining some of the old school tricks from, a few, from quite a few years ago in PC world to create optimal, high quality mobile um, graphics. It does all the work in a single pass. It uses good enough approximations where they're appropriate. And it, uh, you, it, by combining this, we're able to get very high quality frame rates. We demonstrate how to get the most out of these current generation of mobile GPUs to get as close as possible to the waterline. Oh. So we had like to show it off. We have this really cool high poly model of Penn Station that we baked out with some normal maps and simplified to around 150,000 triangles. And we threw in, just to show off what could be fun, some crazy disco ball lights that are dynamic, moving all around, lighting the environment. Using the Daydream Renderer, this scene runs great, you know, well, consistently over 30 frames a second on a day, mobile phone running Daydream right now. The key here, the trick that we're doing, is to play to the strengths of the mobile GPUs. By making sure everything's done in one pass, we greatly reduce the number of draw calls, alleviating CPU overhead. Now, this also minimizes the amount of data sent between the CPU and the GPU, which is important because these phones are very limited in their memory bandwidth. Also, just sending data over the bus actually generates a lot of heat. And when the phones get hot, they get slow. For the same reason, we're sticking with forward rendering. This eliminates that high per pixel memory cost that would be required if you had a deferred renderer looking up into the G buffer. You know, daydream phones have to push a ton of pixels 
The Pixel XL phone has over 3.6 million pixels on screen. It's 1440p. And so apps often render it at an even higher resolution than that because the eye distortion causes a non-uniform density of pixels. So we're dealing with an order of magnitude more pixels to hit, and, but an order of magnitude less vertices than pixels. So anything we can move from the pixel shader to the vertex shader is a huge 10x win. This lets us achieve effects like per pixel lighting by moving some of the computation to be pre-done in the vertex shader. We do this by transforming each of the lights into tangent space and accumulating along the three basis vectors. The resulting colors are then interpolated by the GPU and then passed into the pixel shader for the final per pixel lighting. So you can still create those modern shiny, bumpy materials, you know, reflections, have the, your particle lighting, all without sacrificing frame rate. The Daydream renderer also comes with a static lighting baker that uses the same lighting model, allowing you to tag the unchanging lights as static and get them, that lighting baked into the vertex color. This allows you to create wonderful shadows and ambient occlusion effects, combining with the dynamic light seamlessly so you, for your specular. You'll notice here that there's a bit of ambient occlusion behind the pillars and behind those ridges that's holding up the arch. You could have done this by baking all those shadows into another map, a light map, but that would require that additional texture read which has additional memory bandwidth concerns. And so by putting it in the vertex light, we can reduce that pressure on the bus. Yeah. Be aware that because everything's vertex lit is uh, doing some vertex lighting, even though it's actually final per pixel lighting, it does require additional effort to make sure all your objects are sufficiently tessellated. But we're working on actually making that easier too. Now, there's only so much here that we can just do ourselves. We got, there's one of me, there's like a hundred of you. And so this frontier is huge. We can't explore it all. We want to encourage you to join us here. Our workflow team has been cooking up tools to make it really quick and easy to develop these new experiences. Now, one of the major bottlenecks, I'm sure all of you have experienced, is just the build and deploy time to iterate on the device. Every time you do this, it can take five minutes. You know, you hit the build button, and now you know you're going to spend five minutes, so you go over, grab a snack, maybe some water, come back to your computer and get to try it out. Now, this isn't good. That's a huge amount of time if you want to iterate. And so Instant Preview cuts this out by removing that need to fully build and push to the device. It's like having a horse that lets you just move around this world way quicker than you would otherwise by foot. What it does is it works by making your phone act like a remote control. The phone streams back to the computer all the input information, the controller input, the gyro information for what direction you're facing, touch, and that is all handled then on the PC. So you don't need to compile and redeploy it all to try out a new experience. You can just do it all in the editor. Now, all, because of this, all the rendering is actually done on the PC, which does come with a limitation. That means that the performance characteristics of this aren't uh, matching the actual performance characteristics on device. So this is useful when you want to test out gameplay, but if you're testing the actual runtime performance, you do need to build and deploy to the device. We have this available for Daydream right now, and we're working to make this available for Tango later in the year. Now, when you're switching over from virtual world to the world of augmented reality, 
we need to find ways to connect that virtual world with the real one. These are two worlds that, you know, the normal way we're doing things, they're not used to being connected. And we need new technology, like the train, to connect these two widely split up worlds. One way to make this link real is to have it so that objects can, virtual objects can move around the world aware of what's open space and what's not. Now, if I had it, added a virtual cat here, it should be able to walk around, know it to walk around the podium as opposed to just walk straight through it. Though if there's an actual virtual cat, it'd probably jump up on my laptop and start just typing on the keyboard, kind of bothering and trying to distract me. So this is environmental pathfinding. This video, this is supposed to be playing, and I think this is the loading that didn't happen, unfortunately, earlier. You'll get to see it in the next slide. Um, this is built on top of Tango's 3D reconstruction library. It uses the depth sensor on a Tango device to build a 3D model of the world, and then that model, that mesh, can be used just like a Unity nav mesh. This lets you use Unity's built-in pathfinding to navigate around and intelligently know where you can and can't walk. This is what allows a virtual object to move around the world just like a real one. All of this, by the way, is done in real time. The mesh gets updated as you move to new areas, and so you don't need to like pre-map the world. This allows that elephant that's on the chair to properly jump down to the floor and walk around the chair and know that it needs to also jump up onto the table where it can walk around. OK, I'm not sure why the slot, this one isn't animating as well. I'll have to show you afterward if you want to see these videos, because they're actually really cool. And it's not shown on my uh, slides here for some reason. So that same mesh that can be used to build a nav mesh can also be used to build an occlusion mesh. Occlusion's one of those things that's like so much a natural part of the world that we're just used to having it. And we don't think about how much work it takes to recreate that in an AR experience. It's critical to make the world look right. Because in the real world, a further away object appears behind the things that are in front of it. But the way that the AR technology works, we just have a picture of the real world, and then you're drawing things on top of it. So you need to know to not draw certain things. We have a sample right now that shows how to build this occlusion mesh again in real time and use it for rendering where the objects properly get hidden behind the real world. Both of these are part of the beginnings of an AR element that we'll be releasing in, for Unity later this year. Now, one very common desire with AR is to create an experience that's specifically tied to the pl particular place you're in. So this means the phone needs to not just know how it's moving around, but it needs to know where it is relative to the whole world. We, with Tango, this is done using VPS. Back in the frontier days, this was done by navigating via the stars. At the Detroit Institute of Arts, this is being used right now to allow visitors to actually peek inside of real objects. You can see here a person looking at a CAT scan of the skeleton that's inside that mummy. And a visitor can now actually see a, the crack that's inside the mummy's skull that otherwise would be all covered up by all these bandages. This blending of the real and virtual world allows visitors to feel way more engaged with the museum exhibit and feel like they're just learning way more. And like, by the way, the app that does this won the American Alliance of Museums annual competition in games and augmented reality.
because, and I, I like this, it delivered meaningful uh, engagement outcomes for the people who used it. They actually like saw people learned and remembered more after going to this experience. VPS achieves this. Let's see how well the video plays. Yes. So VPS achieves this by us going into venues where we've got permission and recording all the visual features for the space. We've got here a visualization of how that works in a uh, big box store called Lowe's. As the Tango devices walk around the store, you can see we're detecting and saving all the visual features and recording where they are in their 3D space. This is all done purely with the visual feature tracking. It doesn't use any other hardware. No Bluetooth beacons, no GPS is needed to create this map. All the captures then get uploaded to the cloud where we can further put a ton of computing power into it and dramatically improve the quality of that map. If you're curious, by the way, this has over 300 million points used to provide localization in a 900,000 square foot indoor space. And here's a video of how the localization process then works in that store. Let's let it load. So by the way, we realize just like you need to on your app give the app permission to you access GPS, that fine location. We require you, the app, to ask for the same permission to use VPS to get a very fine centimeter level precision to localize. So the user always needs to actually give this permission. Once you've given that, our tech can look for those features and localize against them. You can see each of these points identified as one of those lines. This is then used to localize against the cloud map and provide um, a continuous realignment with, for the device's position and orientation in the world. Now, this VPS, it's in private beta right now, so you can't start using it today. This is down the road. But if you want to build an app for it, there's a number of things you can do to get ready. First of all, you go to our web website, developers.google.com slash tango, and you can sign up there to get updates. With that, you can also download our SDK and be able to use it to build on the current core features of Tango, the motion tracking, depth sensing, and area learning. You can use this to build a Tango app, and VPS then will sit on top of that. And then start brainstorming and building prototypes of what the experiences you expect to make. When we go further and try to and put this into a public beta, we're going to want to solicit all information from the community about the type of apps people want to make with it. So overall, our whole goal is to make these awesome experiences easy to use within your existing development environment using Unity. Elements and Renderer do this by giving you that head start a good home base to go for near that experience you want to make. And the renderer allows you to create that high quality graphical fidelity that you want your game to feel. Instant preview lets you move faster around, iterate quickly in terms of you know, se seconds instead of minutes, and actually on device, which lets you explore more and reach experiences you otherwise wouldn't have had time to get to. Environmental pathfinding allows those virtual objects to be tied in with the real ones and feel more like they're actually part of the space. And VPS goes further, letting you actually tie the specific virtual objects to a particular location on Earth. This lets you link up those vir that virtual world with the real one to create more engaging AR experiences. I hope that all the work that we've done allows you to create a cool, engaging experience that you otherwise wouldn't be able to create. So if you want to know more, we've got a booth back there where it says Google and Daydream and Tango. I'll be there for, honestly, the rest of today to answer any questions. I wish I had some time here, but I'm already like three minutes over. I can also, at that time, show you the cool video of the elephant walking around. So please come over there if you have any other questions. 
And I'm just so glad to have you all here and excited to see what new apps and experiences you're going to make in virtual reality or augmented reality. Thank you so much.